Hey, what's up? I'm Mr. Hanish, and welcome to my flipped classroom. Today we continue answering the question, what should I know about a country when I study it? And we'll be spending time talking about the economy. Now, you may already have an idea of what an economy is. I mean, they should talk about it on the news enough, but I know you probably don't watch the news. The truth is, the economy is just the system of production, trade, and consumption of goods. Bottom line in the world economy today is simply money, 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 money. Economies matter because like we talked about with natural resources, money makes you powerful. Countries with money can buy resources and pay for militaries, attract businesses, and provide better services for their people. However, not all economies are created the same. And there are three different types that we need to know before we go any further. The first type of economy we'll talk about has literally been around since the beginning of time. It is aptly named the traditional economy. Traditional economies don't rely on currency, so they don't really use money. Does that make sense? <laughs> Mr. Cheesy Jokes, Mr. Cheesy Jokes. Cheesy Jokes. Actually, they wouldn't make sense because, again, they don't use currency. Instead, traditional economies rely on the barter system or straight up trading. Most people in traditional economies are subsistence farmers or farmers that grow just enough for them and their family to survive and they might just sort of trade whatever extra product they come up with for something that they couldn't make on their own. The second type of economy is the command economy, where the central government does all the planning on how production, trade, and consumption should be done. This is a great idea in theory. As long as the central government knows the best and most efficient ways to produce, trade, and consume everything, the problem is, that's not usually the case. Communist governments, such as the Soviet Union and its fellow Eastern European communist countries, were a great example of this back during the Cold War era. But anyone that's ever driven in a Yugo, assuming it wasn't completely broken down at the time, would probably tell you a centrally planned, government-owned and operated car company does not make very good cars. That's why we have the third type of economy, and this is the one we find in the United States. And it's called a market economy, or capitalism. The whole point of a market economy is to try and create a free marketplace with unlimited flow and exchange of goods and services. The driving force of the market economy is competition. Competition helps improve the quality of goods and lower prices for the consumer, which is why the market economy has become so successful recently. For example, Car companies will compete to try and offer a better car at a lower price to gain customers and become a successful business. The downside of the market economy is competition. Wait, what? Competition? That, that was the upside. Let me, let me check here. No, that's right. Competition is the upside and downside of the market economy because even though it creates winners, think about car company that sells lots of vehicles and makes lots of profit, it also creates losers. Think the car companies that lose business to the successful one. There are no guarantees in the market economy, and many people would argue that's exactly the motivation people need to work harder to become successful. On the other side of the coin, <laughs> coin, economy, money, uh, mm? Cheesy jokes. Cheesy jokes. On the other side of the coin, there's less security and safety for people to fall back on. So competition, yes, it creates good things, positives. It also might kind of be terrible. Really depends. It's really tough to find a true traditional economy these days. Currency has practically become a necessity worldwide. Many very remote areas with really nothing in them but small villages still have pretty traditional economies where subsistence farmers support themselves, but a lot of those farmers might take their extra crops to a large city market to try and sell. 
It's also tough to find a true command economy. Even in the most hardcore, extreme communist and socialist countries like North Korea, even if the government cracks down hard on its people for using any products not made within their own economy, there are thriving black markets where people can get products and goods produced in other areas around the world. It's even tough to find a true example of a market economy in pure capitalism. In the U.S., for instance, the well-being of our citizens does not solely rely on whether they can be competitive enough to find a job that makes them successful. We have things like Social Security to help seniors that no longer work. We have Medicare and Medicaid to help those that can't afford health care or don't get enough insurance from their jobs. And a number of state and federal programs that help children from low-income families. So even though a country we may study might not match one of these three types of economies exactly, we can usually match it up fairly close. Once we have an idea how their economy runs, we can analyze its stats and figure out where it stands compared to the rest of the world. To do this, there are a few key stats we can look at. Gross Domestic Product Purchasing Power Parity. Gosh, say that five times fast. Well, you don't have to because Gross Domestic Product is always shortened to GDP. And Purchasing Power Parity can be PPP. Yes, insert your own bathroom joke here. Done? Okay, good. Basically, what GDP purchasing power parity is, is the total value of all the goods and services produced by a country over a given year. In essence, it tells us how much that economy is worth in a dollar amount. The higher dollar amount, the more value the goods and services of that country have. GDP per capita is the average amount a person will make in a country over a given year. You can think of it mathematically as the GDP purchasing power parity divided by the population. Or you can think of it as sort of an average salary amount for a country. GDP real growth rate gives us an idea of how much the economy of a country is growing or shrinking in a given year. A high percentage here means the economy is growing very rapidly, which could mean that more businesses are opening and more trade is occurring and possibly the citizens themselves are able to get better jobs and earn more money. A negative percentage, or a really low positive percentage, means the economy either shrank or kind of stayed steady. Higher percentages are typically a good thing, but growing too quickly with your economy also presents challenges. Unemployment rate is something we are probably pretty familiar with. It tells you the percentage of potential workers in a country that have no job or are unemployed. It also doesn't tell the whole story though, so you have to be careful. See, a country may have a very low unemployment rate with a very low percentage, but the people that do have jobs could have really crappy jobs and not make a lot of money. So sometimes you have to look a little further than just this percentage, but it does help us figure out the overall picture. Inflation rate is also a percentage, but it shows the yearly change in prices for consumer products. Prices do change. That's why your grandparents say, back in my day, a Hershey bar was only a nickel. Well, the price of a Hershey bar has changed dramatically since your grandpa was a kid. That's inflation it can be a telling sign of the stability of that country's currency. It's a very delicate system, but generally low percentages show a country has pretty stable inflation rates and that government is pretty steady and can be counted on. Budget surplus or debt shows a balance of how much money a country raised versus how much it spent. If it's a positive percentage, it means the country brought in more than it spent and was able to save money. That's a surplus. But if it's a negative percentage, it means the country basically spent more than it made and had to borrow to cover the difference. That's a debt. Obviously, the positive percentage, or surplus, means the country doesn't have to rely on borrowing from others and might also be a sign of their stability. When you combine all of these statistics that we talked about, and I know there are a ton, 
There are a ton, but when you combine all of these, it gives you a better idea of the performance of an economy, a sort of economic report card, if you will. The reason we look at economic stats before many other kinds is that money affects the country's performance across the board. Which country do you think has better health care, a rich one or a poor one? How about better roads, railways, and airports? Rich or poor? Education? Military? Industry? You get the idea. Money makes the world go round, which is why we need to make sure we know how to analyze everyone's economies. The next video in the series will kind of show you how their economic performance impacts the overall economy in greater detail. But for now, I want you to spend some time and digest all of these stats, because I know I threw a lot at you. So, go study, and until next time, bye bye